All right, so welcome. Today we're talking about lecture three, and the goal is to dive deeper into alignment. So first, we're gonna do a recap of lecture two and sort of review what we learned previously about computing optimal scores recursively and algorithmic variations that save time or space. And uh, also this very cool Excel implementation of that. Then we're gonna be talking about global versus local alignment and sort of variations on the theme of how to start, the, how to change the initial, the start and the end position and the update rules to sort of turn global alignment to local alignment. Then we're gonna look at a very, very cool way of thinking about alignment as uh, number matching. And basically we're gonna look at semi-numerical uh, string matching for exact string matching and how that actually speeds up the computation to uh, linear time or actually uh, even constant time rather than uh, this you know quadratic time and then we're going to look at a variant of that that allows you to look for inexact matching and specifically the blast algorithm by searching first the neighborhood expanding all of the neighborhood searches and then uh, scoring each of those. And then we're gonna look at the probabilistic foundations of alignment. So basically, how do we think about these score matrices and what do they really represent? And what we're gonna do is uh, recognize that in fact, there is a probabilistic view of all of these scoring matrices as log uh, odd scores, negative log odd scores, which is basically giving the additive nature of our algorithm a very cool probabilistic interpretation is multiplying the probabilities, which then leads to uh, p-values directly interpretable from the data. And then if time allows, and uh, if you would like to have your, uh, you know, uh, sort of brain explosion at the end of the lecture, just like we had last week, uh, I will cover very briefly a linear time exact string matching algorithm rather than probabilistic with this fundamental string pre-processing, which is uh, exhibiting and making explicit all of the uh, suffix and prefix self-redundancy of every string and how that immediately gives a linear time algorithm for exact matching. The practical application is not as strong, of course, as BLAST, but the theoretical applications are uh, quite substantial. All right, so let's dive right in. The goal for today is sequence alignment and database search. We're gonna be learning about hashing, which is fundamentally important, and um, also uh, you know, a lot of probabilistic interpretations uh, of our scores, which is also uh, hugely important in machine learning in general. So, quick recap, lecture two. So the goal was to calculate the total score of aligning one string to another string and finding the edit distance between them that allows for insertions, mutations, and deletions. And then we saw that uh, mutations and preservation could be um, thought of as taking a shorter problem of aligning smaller substrings and then expanding those by a character from each of the strings in each case. And alternatively, you could build a longer alignment up from only extending one of the characters by one, uh, one of the sequences by one character, and then inserting a gap in the other one, and vice versa, inserting a gap in this one. And how we could create a matrix that stores all of these intermediate scores by having the, uh, that matrix indexed by the length of the i prefix of s and the length of the j prefix of s of s1 and of s2 and using those prefixes of increasing size as a way to create those longer alignments and we could store those in different entries in the matrix and simply look up the score of the best possible score that i could have by aligning that sub, that prefix to that prefix is already stored there, so I don't need to compute all possible sub problems of that. Then we saw how this could be run across the entire matrix, effectively giving at the bottom the maximum possible score, and how we could trace back from that score to basically create an alignment. And the trace back procedure would be moving either diagonally through this matrix or horizontally or vertically, 
in each case corresponding to an insertion of a character or from both sequences, i.e. a match or a mismatch when the two characters don't uh, agree, or an insertion from only one sequence as I'm constructing that alignment moving back. Again, illustrating these principle of dynamic programming, I could compute the locally optimal score at every position, but the globally optimal score would only be possible by tracing back because this particular locally optimal score is not necessarily part of the globally optimal solution. So I'm saving the choices that I make for the computation of every locally optimal score, and I'm reusing these choices in constructing the globally optimal solution in a second step, which is the trace back. So in the first step, I compute forward, and then I trace back. And we saw how there was this beautiful duality between scores in the matrix and maximum scores of the prefix alignment of the i prefix of S1 and the j prefix of, X of S2, and paths through the matrix, which basically correspond to all possible alignments, inserting a lot of gaps this way and then a lot of gaps that way, or matching a lot of characters as I'm moving diagonally. So there was this duality of best alignment, best path. There's an exponential number of possible paths through the matrix because each time I'm making a three way choice which way to move. So there's effectively something along the lines of three to the n ways of traversing this matrix. But we could search through the best path across all of these exponential number of possible solutions by uh, creating this dynamic programming matrix and then tracing back all in quadratic time, which is polynomial, which is much, much better than uh, exponential. So that's the difference between, I don't know, three to the thousand versus a thousand squared. So a thousand squared is a million, Three to the thousand is, you know, if you had a universe for every atom in our universe a hundred times, that's basically what, you know, three to the thousand means, which is ridiculously large. And then we saw how we could only compute things based on these local computation scores and how we could traverse the matrix horizontally, vertically, diagonally, as long as the previous, um, as long as the previous subproblems that we will need in the current subproblem are already solved and available. And then we saw two very cool modifications uh, to this theme, to algorithmic variations. The first was to save space by, sorry, to save time by only searching near the diagonal, understanding that as soon as you veer off diagonal into this gray zone, you're basically paying a huge amount of cost and therefore solutions that are out there are probably not that interesting anyway. And therefore, if you're just searching for a strong enough solution between two sequences that you know are kind of well related already, then you can just search that diagonal. We also saw a space computing uh, a variation for computing the optimal score, which is kind of trivial, uh, by simply saving the last column of the alignment each time, and that gets you the maximum score just fine. Then we saw, uh, uh, modification of this linear space maximum score computation that could not only compute the maximum score, but could also compute the, uh, max, the, the best path through that score. So that algorithm is basically uh, to recursively compute the forward path going all the way to the middle of that matrix the reverse path going all the way to the middle of that matrix and then adding up the two to find the best traversal and then recursively computing this out. And again, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, all of the details of that algorithm. Then we saw this very cool way of doing all of that in an Excel spreadsheet, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can basically enter your uh, scores here, your gap score, your match and mismatch uh, score for purines and pyrimidines, and then type in your sequences here, and then out come the direct scores of matching a character to a character, reading from that matrix, the maximum score for every matrix mij in um, the prefix i and the prefix j of the two characters, and then whether that maximum score matches the score computed from the top, from the diagonal left, or from the left uh, in these symbols, and then lastly the traceback, and of course, the computation of um, appending those sequences, all of that can be done in Excel spreadsheet, which is kind of fun because you can 
basically create these cool bifurcations, you can play with the scoring scheme, you can play with the characters up, up there, and uh, so on and so forth. All right, so who's with me so far? Let's see, uh, how well are you remembering the last lecture? Beautiful. All right, so we have 247200. All right, so today we're gonna dive deeper into alignments. First, we're gonna look at what does local alignment mean compared to global alignment, and we're gonna look at the needleman wunsch algorithm uh, and the Smith-Waterman algorithm as two varieties for both global and local alignment, and then how to vary gap penalties and various algorithm speedups. So what is local alignment? Local alignment basically says, I don't care to align the whole string S to the whole string T. I'm just gonna create a sub-alignment of a portion of S to a portion of T. So a local alignment of strings S and T is an alignment of a substring of S with a substring of T. Why do we care about local alignment? Because, for example, very small domains of a gene might be the only conserved portions. So if I only care about the domain, um, you know, of, I don't know, that, that's a transmembrane domain or a, I don't know, RNA binding domain of a protein, then I don't really care about the rest of the protein. I just care about that domain. Or I might be looking for a small gene in a large chromosome. So I might be, you know, searching for that gene uh, in a long chromosome, and you know, maybe the whole gene is not conserved. Maybe it's just a small portion of the gene. Or because when I look at two large chromosomes, large segments very often undergo rearrangement. So then I kind of want to sort of focus on the subset of these regions that are truly orthologous, that are truly related evolutionarily, rather than forcing a single path through that matrix, I might want to sort of create multiple paths through that matrix. The way to illustrate that is going back to our little dot plot views that we had earlier, and basically say that what global alignment does is that it forces you to find all of the diagonally aligning portions along a single path through that matrix. Whereas what local alignment does is that it allows you to say, well, hey, there's a strong, a strong match between this portion here and that portion there. And there's another strong match between here and there. And there's another strong match here, another, another, another strong match there. I don't necessarily need to be able to thread them all together. I just need to sort of, you know, reveal that, wow, this gene seems to have moved and it's not the end of the world. And forcing me to sort of create a single path would basically create an alignment of only this portion, you know, B to B and C to C, missing out on A and D or A and C, but missing out on the other two, or those two, and so on and so forth, whereas the true alignment is simply corresponding to a series of rearrangements where this portion B is here, this portion D is here, this portion A moved, and this portion C moved, okay? Uh, does everybody see this? So um, we are able to capture these uh, very funky rearrangements by just looking at short, uh, diagonals through the matrix. So who's with me on sort of understanding the definition of a local alignment? Basically the goal is we're only going to look for portions of, a, of the two sequences that are matching rather than the whole thing and biologically this is very meaningful in a series of uh, rearrangements for example of genes in a chromosome or domains in a protein. So uh, 291000, that's great. Um, the problem, however, is that local alignment is not necessarily well-defined. And the reason for that is that I don't really know if I should be expanding a further, if I should be, you know, sort of using the maximal uh, high scoring portion as the, you know, I mean, where do I stop? If there's some weak match sort of flanking this, do I include this weak match or not? What constitutes an, an optimal local alignment? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we start looking at the algorithms for local alignment. So the first question is, how do we transform our global alignment procedure into a local alignment procedure? If anybody wants to raise their hand and take a stab at answering or just unmuting yourself, what would I need to do to transform the needleman wunsch algorithm, which is this global alignment algorithm, into the Smith-Waterman algorithm, which is this local alignment algorithm? So first I initialized at the top left and then I terminated at the bottom right 
And my update was looking at these three options, top, uh, above and to the left, left, and uh, above. So what do I need to change here? You can type in your answers in chat, or you can uh, unmute yourself, or you can raise your hands, or any of the above. So um, I see a couple of answers, that's great. Allow termination anywhere. So uh, Sonia, you're absolutely right. So Thomas changed the termination, that's right too. So allow termination everywhere, that's brilliant. What else do I need to do? Type in your answers or raise your hand or speak up. And the TAs, since I don't have the view of everyone, if somebody, um, yeah, initialize anywhere. Lily, that's absolutely right. Andrew, also allow initiation everywhere. That's brilliant. So instead of initializing only there, I can just start anywhere. Anything else? This would be enough, but I could also change the update to basically also allow to restart from a zero, which is effectively initialize anywhere. Okay? So that's absolutely right. So basically the three things that I need to do is you know, I can allow either a zero at the top or a zero anywhere in this top uh, row or this leftmost column, and then termination anywhere, and then non-negative matrix says Evelyn. That's also correct. Basically, choosing the zero at any point basically allows me to, um, you know, restart anywhere. And frankly, by having the zero here, I don't really need that since at any point I can just choose to restart. Okay, that's awesome. You guys are rocking it. So that's global and that's local. So global starts at the top left and at the bottom right. Local starts anywhere and ends anywhere. And then, you know, uh, has a zero here, which allows it to start anywhere. What about semi-global? What semi-global does is that it basically says, well, as I'm doing my sequencing reaction, I might just have a chimeric read. So there might be a rearrangement or I might just have, you know, junk nonsensical sequence after a while. So what I want to do is make sure that I cover uh, at least one of the sequences all the way to the end. So how do I do that? Any suggestions, please type them in. So basically, I don't want to have any end gap penalty. So the way to do that is where do I want to initialize? I can initialize anywhere on the top edge or the left edge, absolutely. And then I can terminate anywhere on the bottom row or on the rightmost column. And does my initialization, my iteration change? Not really. So the iteration is the same as for global alignment. The initialization is top row or left column and the terminations bottom row right column. This is kind of cool, right? We've basically taken this super complex problem and we're now, by abstracting it away into this matrix computation, we can just create, create variations of our algorithm that are just super easy to, to come about, to understand, to explain, to rationalize. We can also change uh, alignment to have a generalized gap penalty. So one way to do that is to basically say, well, I'm going to allow anything along the column or anything along the rows, and I'm going to search over the maximum over any of these positions, but then we might not need to be so general. One way to, uh, is the, the problem of that is that you basically turned a local computation, which was order one, into an order n computation. And that basically suddenly turns an n squared algorithm into an n cube algorithm. So for a thousand by a thousand character alignment, I suddenly have, you know, to run a thousand times slower. So instead of being a million, it's now a billion operations that I need to do. So it's extremely, extremely slow. So it's a cubic runtime. But we could instead have an affine gap penalty. So what a fine gap penalty means is that I will pay first an initial cost for starting a gap, and then a small incremental cost for extending a gap. And the reason for this is that when polymerase makes a mistake to sort of skip 
it kind of can skip over multiple characters, multiple nucleotides. But then, you know, the longer the gap, the more the penalty, but you pay a high initial penalty for having started the skipping operation. So the way that you can actually create uh, this kind of function using our matrices is to create what we call state. And we're gonna get into state next, uh, at the next lecture as we start talking about heat markup models. But basically right now, you could add a binary value for every sequence, remembering whether I'm starting a gap or not. And the first time that I'm starting a gap, I will pay that initial penalty. And then after that, I basically have a value that I'm remembering of whether I am starting a gap or not. And the way to implement this is to remember two separate scores. One score is basically saying, oh, what is the current maximum score if I'm now starting a new gap? And what is the current maximum score if I'm in the middle of continuing a new gap? So basically the implementation would be to add a second matrix for an already in gap state, okay? And the way to do that is as you're making the decision of which character, of which score to build on uh, for your, um, for your uh, matrix, you basically can say, well, I have three choices. I can build on this, I can build on that, I can build on that, or I might build on extending a gap where that score for extending a gap in another matrix might actually be lower. So if I'm extending a gap, I can just choose that other score. Or if I choose to start the gap, then I'm, I'm selecting from this matrix, okay? So let's see who's with me on this additional matrix for remembering the state of, I'm now starting a new uh, uh, you know, gap. Then I sort of store the score of being in a gap but then if I extend an existing gap, I can just look up more uh, from the previous one. So here I would have one more option for looking at the matrix with an additional gap. All right, so eight, 12, eight, zero, zero. So again, that's a little more advanced, but you don't have to worry about it uh, fully. Basically what I'm trying to illustrate is the power of what we've done. We basically now can look at all kinds of changes to that original algorithm by sort of rationalizing directly on these matrix computations. Another way to do it would be to uh, basically say that, well, gaps in uh, protein coding regions have to be multiples of three because they preserve the reading frame of translation. So maybe I wanna pay a much lower score for gaps that are multiples of three, but a higher score for, for gaps that are not multiples of three. And you can, again, remember that by having one more state. And your possible states are I'm starting a gap or I am mod three one in the gap and mod three two in a gap or mod three zero in a gap and so on and so forth. So you can play with this dynamic programming variation to sort of create additional algorithms. So that's the point that I want you to get out of this. The fact that we now have global alignment fully figured out, local alignment fully figured out, and then we can create varying gap penalties, various algorithmic speed ups, by sort of thinking about the uh, DP abstracted problem. All right, so that's for global alignment and for local alignment. Now, let's see if we wanna build local alignment, especially if I wanna be searching through uh, a short string uh, very rapidly. So remember earlier when we motivated local alignment, we basically said that I might want to search uh, a small gene in a large chromosome. Yeah, sure, if I'm searching for a small gene in a large chromosome, one way to do it would be to search for that uh, string in a local alignment with the entire chromosome. And that's extremely expensive. It's basically taking, I don't know, a thousand bases and then searching them against a million bases. So it's suddenly a billion computations uh, that I need to do, a billion comparisons between character and character. What can I do instead? What I could do instead is interpret my, my numbers semi-numerically, okay? So let's talk about the carp rabin algorithm that allows us to do this. So when I'm looking for an exact match of a pattern with no gaps, 
What the car wrapping algorithm allows you to do is to interpret the string numerically and therefore do the computation in constant time. So we're going to start with a broken version of the algorithm and then progressively fix it to make the solution work. And then we're going to look at deterministic linear time uh, algorithms. So basically, those deterministic ones are the Z algorithm, the Boyer Moore algorithm, the suffix trees, suffix arrays, and so on and so forth. So these are very cool things to uh, look up for yourselves and a lot of really cool algorithms, especially on the concept of suffix trees and suffix arrays. Uh, and we're going to also cover uh, Burr's Wheeler transforms later this term, which is another variation of the suffix tree concept of storing the self-similarity of an array uh, or of a string or of a query or of a target um, in various ways. And we're going to look a little bit into that with Burr's Wheeler transform. Okay, so now let's dive into the carp rabbit algorithm. What does it allow you to do? The key idea is I'm going to interpret my string as a number. So I'm going to search this particular gene into this very large, large chromosome. And the way that I'm going to interpret my gene is instead of saying, oh, it's character three followed by character one, followed by character five, by character one and character five. Instead, I'm going to interpret it as, I don't know, 10,000 times five. Okay, uh, 31,450. So now I'm going to search for this number in this string of numbers. So the key idea is that if I interpret in these strings as numbers, I can just do that in a single unit operation. Simply ask, hey, are you 31,415? Are you 31,115? Are you 31,415? And when I match, I'm all set, okay? Who sees this as the key concept? Even though there's a lot of problems with it, who gets the intuition of what we're about to do? So Arez is asking, this is clearly not element-wise mapping. So first of all, 225110. Uh, um, this is clearly not element-wise mapping, more than four integers. How do you choose the window size? So my window size might be my string itself. And then we're going to talk about window size when we talk about the blast algorithm. But for now, my window size is the entire string. So I'm searching for this whole number. And therefore, my window size is dictated by my string. All right, so this is nice and cool. Everybody gets the intuition behind that. But now we have also on any computer, you can only process, yeah, of course. So um, we're gonna talk about that, uh, Guillaume, uh, very shortly. All right, so the key idea is, you know, we're now gonna do this, and then this number is gonna be 23,000, 35,000, 59,000, and so on and so forth. And eventually, Y7 is gonna be 31,000. So the quick little program is, Compute x, basically, you know, my query. And then for every i, compute y i, basically compute each of these numbers. And then if that matches, then print a doesn't match, okay? <laughs> this obviously doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because um, it takes us a long time to compute this number from the previous one. Sorry, to compute this number. So basically to compute 31,415 from this, I need to basically take five, add it to 10 times five, uh, sorry, one times 10, and then add that to four times 100, add that to one times 10,000, or sorry, one times 1,000, and add that to three times 10,000. So basically for every um, power of 10, as I go through these strings, I basically need to do uh, an addition and a multiplication, which is basically a linear time computation. So I kind of blew it there. However, we're gonna see how we can compute the next number based on the previous one, and therefore go back to an order one computation. So how is that? Well, suppose that I've already computed 31,415. How do I compute 14,152 in a constant number of operations? So to do this, I need to figure out a function that will transform this number into this number using a constant number of steps. So can anybody see what those steps might be? So 
Notice that the middle, 1, 4, 1, 5, is the same. So what I need to do is add the 3 at the front, sorry, remove the 3 at the front and add the 2 at the back, and then shift these numbers by 1. So how do I do that? Super easy. To compute the new number, I basically take the old number, subtract 10,000 times whatever digit that was to get rid of that digit. So that basically gets rid of the 3, and I have 1, 4, 1, 5. And then I want to left shift it by multiplying by 10. And then I want to add the lower order bit, which is the number 2. Okay? So basically, the middle number, the middle digits of the number are already computed. I just need to shift them to the left, remove the higher order bit, and add the lower order bit. Okay? Who's 100% with me on this one? So. Very cool. This is cool, right? So basically, I can now compute all of these numbers super, super fast because I can reuse the computation. You guys are masters at reusing computation now. So I can basically uh, compute my numbers. So 27, 2, 1, 0, 0. All right. So there's a, there's a new problem that arises, of course, which is, you know, I come in and I'm like, oh, great. I want to match a string of length 1,000 against the chromosome of length a million. So uh, great. I'm going to have all these 1,000-digit numbers in my computer. Uh, and these are some very, very big numbers. So the problem is that the computer simply doesn't have the power to compute uh, you know, on such long numbers. So to get the order in time, we need to perform every operation in cost and time. But if the arguments are you know, m bits long, this can actually take order of m time. So if I have a thousand long, um, a thousand character number, um, I need to somehow compute every part separately because my machine can only fit 32 bits at a time, not a thousand bits at a time. So what we need to do is actually reduce the range of the numbers to something more manageable. Okay. So one way to do that is hashing. So what is hashing? Hashing is a very cool fundamental computer science technique to basically map a very large universe, U, into an eeny bitty little space. So I'm going to basically select K, which is a key that I'm hashing, from a huge universe. This is the universe of all 1,000 digit numbers. Okay, That's an enormous universe. It can represent basically 2 to the 1,000 possibilities, way, way more than the number of universes in every atom of our universe, and so on and so forth. Okay? So to do this, enormous mapping into a tiny little space, we're going to basically, quote unquote, hash every key into a smaller space. So one hash function might be to, I don't know, add up all the bits and then, you know, uh, do this progressive adding of bits across different parts. Another one might be to take the modulo. Another one might be to just take the first 20 bits of my number or the last 20 bits of my number. Okay. So what are desirable properties of a hash function? So we want it to be reproducible so that every time I compute this function on the same two numbers, uh, the hashes match. Basically, if x matches y, then I want the hash of x to match the hash of y. Basically, the hash of x is always the same. And the other hugely important property, and it sounds super trivial, but it's hard to obtain, is that there's a uniform output distribution. So even though I'm taking this enormous insights, you know, starting space, when I compute out of it, I want I want to cover the entire set of numbers, okay? So the way to think about this is that I have an enormous space that I'm trying to map into a smaller space. I want the coverage of this smaller space to be kind of uniform. I don't want all of the numbers to map right here, okay? I don't want, I don't want that. I want, and I don't want this either, okay? What I want, because then there's unused spaces. If I have this, Basically, all of the numbers are going to be landing on the same space, and that's not very desirable because it leads to what we're going to call collisions. Okay? 
what I would like is some kind of uniformity in the way that I, that I match the characters so that as I take this enormous space and I map it into this tiny, tiny little space, I cover most of the tiny space. I don't just cover a tiny fraction of that tiny space, okay? Uh, let's see, who's with me so far on hashing and this desirable uniformity in the distribution with which I'm mapping this huge space of numbers into this tiny, tiny little space. I want that tiny little space to be uniformly covered. So uh, Guillaume, pairwise independent hash functions are good, but they're not giving us the runtime desirabilities that we would like. In order for the runtime desirabilities to actually match, we need this additional uniformity. Okay, so uh, 235301. Um, okay, so how do we achieve this? How do we basically map this huge space into this tiny little space while covering that space uniformly for any input distribution? The way to do that is to make sure that your, um, that your hash result depends on all of the bits of the initial number. Basically, if I only take some of the bits, then you know, I am much more likely to, to generate these collisions. Okay? So one way to do this hashing is to basically uh, do the mod 13. And mod 13 basically does depend on all of the digits because it's effectively um, you know, like creating that number wheel and then going around it uh, you know, every 13, you kind of come back to itself. And that basically means that um, these numbers, if they're sort of uniformly distributed in that universe, they're gonna be uni uniformly distributed in that other uh, smaller space, okay? So this is one way to hash, to basically take this very, very large space and then map it onto simply the mod 13 of that, which basically for 31,415 corresponds to seven, and then for 14,158, two corresponds to eight, okay? And the beauty of that is that I'm, as I'm computing the next number based on the previous number, all of these operations, I can do mod 13, okay? So that's very important because I don't wanna be computing on thousand digit long numbers. I wanna be computing on very small numbers. And of course, instead of 13 here, I'm gonna have, I don't know, 13, 13 or 13, 13, 13, just like something much, much smaller than all of the numbers in, you know, between zero and two to the 1000, okay? So that's what the hashing will do. So basically, uh, hashing basically has resolved this problem of while wow, these numbers were very long, but it has created a new problem, which is collisions. So what are collisions? I've been using this term already. A collision is when the hash of X matches the hash of Y, it's the same, but X is actually different from Y. And that's of course going to happen because I'm mapping this very large universe, basically, all you know, people in the United States into a tiny, tiny little space, namely all the numbers between, I don't know, one and a hundred. So to give you another example, if I take your uh, MIT ID numbers, okay? Every single one of these numbers is, I don't know, nine digits long. So that basically means that there are two to the nine possible entries uh, in your, uh, you know, if I, if I basically indexed everything according to your social security number or your uh, MIT ID number, okay? So basically, the universe that I'm mapping from is, you know, two to the, you know, I don't know, all numbers that have uh, nine digits or something like that, okay? So this is the size of the space that I'm starting from. But, you know, there's only, I don't know, 50 students in the class. So basically, I don't want to allocate all of that space in memory. I want to allocate a much smaller space in memory. And one way to do that is to basically hash numbers from the you know, nine digit long numbers to much smaller numbers. One way to do that is to basically take the modulo 50 and then all of your numbers are gonna be landing somewhere around here. And then I'll be able to sort of then check if indeed the original number that I had matches 
the hash, uh, if, if two numbers map to the same hash entry, I can then simply compute the original numbers to basically check if they do match. And if they started from different places and they, if they map to the same place, then you know, there's gonna be a collision. Or if they're actually the same number, then they're gonna match. But that's, you know, that's something that Python does trivially by creating dictionaries. At any point, you can basically create a dictionary, which is basically mapping this very, very large space into a small number of entries with only the memory allocation needed for the number of students in the class, instead of you know all of the possible numbers and atoms in the universe. Okay. So let's see. Chat. Can we use perfect hashing to eliminate? Yeah, perfect hashing is possible, but perfect hashing is actually quite expensive. So you know, you know, you don't need to do this kind of overkill, but yes, absolutely. So how do we, what do we deal with? Uh, wh what do we do when we find a collision? How do we deal with collision? So here's an example of a collision. I basically, I'm searching for the number 31,415, but I've now hashed it to a much smaller space of, you know, modulo 13. And I go through and most of the numbers don't, don't have a collision, which is great basically shows how great my hash function is. But every now and then, I'm gonna have a collision. So basically that's a valid match because the actual original matches, and that's a spurious hit because the actual original doesn't match. So what are the consequences of mod p hashing? The good is that it enables fast computation. We can now use smaller numbers. The bad is that it leads to spurious hits, collisions. So how do we deal with the bad? So first, we're, need, we're gonna to need to verify that a hit, i.e the match of the hash corresponds to a valid match, i.e. the match of the original numbers. So basically we're gonna to have to recompute the equality for the entire string, not just the hash, okay? So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna compute the numbers, modulo P, we're gonna compute YI by reusing YI minus one, and now we're gonna check every time there's a match in other words, if yi matches uh, x modulo p, then that's a hit. But I want to know if the hit is actually a match or not. So to know if the hit is a match, I'm basically now going to ask if p is actually equal to the substring starting at position i, okay, all the way to i plus length of p. So if indeed that original string matches, then I print that there's a match, and otherwise I just continue because it's a spurious hit. Okay? Who's 100% with me here on the pseudocode? Okay, so 26300, that's great. Um, so there's another question in the chat. Are Monte Carlo algorithms acceptable in this context? Let's talk about this offline, yeah. Um, so, the, um, so basically the end result is that I've now managed to uh, compute things in linear time. However, every now and then I'm gonna pay this quadratic time, okay? Every now and then, I'm gonna to have to pay the full cost. So basically, every single one of my computations is now constant time, but every now and then I'll have to pay linear time. And that means that our, my algorithm in the worst case will be quadratic, but in the best case, it will be linear because I will have to pay this only a certain number of times. So the reason why we want this uniform distribution in hashing is because we only want to pay for this linear time uh, penalty one out of m times rather than all the time, okay? Where m is the subspace that I'm mapping things into. Could we do another round of hashing with a different mod to reduce? Absolutely, so now uh, this is a great suggestion. So basically now it's basically saying, hey, why don't I hash twice? So I can hash one mod p, and one mod p plus two or something like that. And then mod p plus two, you know, I don't know, 13 and 11, uh, just two relatively prime numbers uh, that are prime relative to each other. Um, 
And then that basically means that I'm reducing that probability of collision by another factor of n, which is uh, quite remarkable. So um, basically, the reason why we're trying to make sure that the hits, that the, that the spurious hits happen infrequently is because then it sort of scales up our total compute. So basically, we, it avoids, uh, we want to avoid the worst case behavior of many collisions with a bad M. So we're going to usually choose a random M at the beginning. So the other challenge is that both the algorithm and the analysis become more complex. We're going to now have to compute the expected runtime rather than the deterministic runtime. Because the best case runtime is linear. The worst case runtime is quadratic. But the expected runtime depends on how often I'm going to have to go back and check the original string when I didn't really have to. So we're going to have to show that the probability of a spurious hit is small, and therefore that the expected runtime is linear. Okay. So um, to put it all together, we're going to basically compute uh, the match by interpreting strings as numbers, thus enabling a very fast computation. And there are other semi-numerical methods like fast Fourier transform, shift and etc. And to make all of this work, we're going to have to basically compute the next number based on the previous one, rather than the order n computation that we had before. That gives us an order one computation. We're going to hash modulo p to keep the numbers small. That's again an order one computation instead of order n computation because of these thousand character long numbers. And then we're going to have to deal with collisions. And that's suddenly where you have a randomized uh, expected runtime. It's a randomized probability uh, algorithm. And then that gives us order one in expectation. Okay. So uh, let's see who's with me so far on um, this whole part two of semi-numerical string matching. All right. Very cool. So 18, 11, 2, 0, 0. Um, all right, so now let's build on this concept of hash functions to basically speed things up even further. And let's now allow for inexact matching rather than just exact string matching. So the problem that we have from before is that if you know I'm, I'm trying to match strings and this is 31,415, maybe mismatch in one character would be okay. Like 31,405 would be just fine with a one character mismatch. But the solution that we've looked at now doesn't allow this at all. It's either matching perfectly or in mod space, it could be anywhere, okay? So how do we now allow for inexact string matching? So that's where this BLAST algorithm comes from. It's a very cool acronym. It's basically basic local alignment and search tool, but it's also blastingly fast, which is super, super fast. So how do we um, you know, understand this algorithm? So basically here's what BLAST tries to do. It says, well, with sequence alignment, we kind of assume that the sequences have some kind of common ancestry. Find, and, and, and finding the right alignment between the two sequences is um, you know expensive, but we want to basically and it, because it has an evolutionary interpretation of the minimum number of events, etc. And that's sort of what we saw in the second lecture by assuming that the sequences have some common mastery. But the sequence database search problem, which is the problem that Blast is trying to do, is given a query, a new sequence, and given a target, which is many many old sequences. We want to ask which sequences, if any, are related to the query. And the individual alignments don't need to be perfect. Once the initial matches are reported, we can then fine tune them afterwards. But the query must be super, super fast for a new sequence. And the key insight is that most sequences will be completely unrelated to the query. So we don't need to, as to align every single one of them super well and sort of have this evolutionary interpretation. So what we're gonna do is exploit the distinct nature of the database search problem. How? 
namely that there are going to be many spurious hits. And we're going to say, well, if we're going to reject any match that has less than 90% uh, you know, identity, where the identity percentage is less than 90, then why bother even looking at sequences which don't have a stretch of 10 nucleotides in a row? Therefore, we can pre-screen sequences for common long stretches, and we're going to put the speed where we need it, namely, we're going to pre-process the data because that happens offline, and once the query arrives, we're going to act super fast. So then the solution is going to be this content-based indexing and blast. So the example is, you know, we could index all tenmers, and the idea is that only one tenmer in four to the k will match. That's one in a million. Even if we have 500 kmers, that's only one in 2,000 that will match. And there's many additional speedups that are possible. Okay, so that's the basis of this basic local alignment search tool. That's the BLAST algorithm. And if you look at the uh, BLAST algorithm, it was developed, you know, back in 1990, and it still continues to have 4,000 citations every year. So that has a total of 55,000 citations. And that's just for the first version. The second version, Gap Blast and Side Blast, has another 55,000 citations. So, uh, you know, many of us would say, oh, great, I have this awesome paper, let me work on something else now. But no, they said, well, let's make it even better. So, uh, what were the two key insights? One insight is hashing. Just like carp rabbin, this semi numerical string matching. So, it's basically taking these numbers and then hashing them, computing them as a number. The second key insight is this neighborhood search, where we are allowing to find hits even when there's not a single exact tamer that matches. So let me explain. I receive my query, and then I split it into overlapping words of length W. Okay, so I'm gonna chop it off into three mers, and then, I'm going to effectively hash all of these streamers to basically then expand them out into a longer match. And now I'm working on amino acid space rather than uh, nucleotide space. Okay. So the key idea of the neighborhood search is that instead of simply hashing the exact string, knowing how well amino acids match to each other, knowing how similar amino acids are, in, I don't know, functional space, we're gonna basically expand the neighborhood of all possible three amino acid strings that are sufficiently similar to my query word up until some threshold, okay? So PQG has the you know, total um, score of 18, and I might have a score of, I don't know, 80% of that or 70% of that, and then go all the way down to 13 and then consider all neighbors of that, and then go and hash all of the neighbors in my database, okay? So the key idea that's different from what Carp Rabin was doing is that we're creating this hash table and we're searching this hash table by looking for all of the neighbors of our word up until some threshold. Okay, so we're splitting the query into overlapping words. We're finding the neighborhood words for every word until some threshold T. And then we're gonna look up in our table where these neighborhood words occur by creating this giant hash table that basically tells us for every, I don't know, streamer in our sequence, what are all of the places where this streamer occurs in our database. And then once we have the hit, we're gonna extend it to look for a match which is sufficiently high up until some score X, okay? And then we're gonna report the significance and the alignment for every one of those matches, okay? So just to recap, we take our query, we break it up into a set of streamers, and then for every streamer, we're gonna expand this neighborhood and then search that neighborhood and expand that into a match. So let's see who's with me so far on the BLAST algorithm. And I'll be right back.
Okay, so um, are there any questions so far? So 14, 12, 3, 3, 0. So um, type in your questions. So again, the key idea here is that I'm going to create one giant database that tells me for every 10 mer or for every 3 mer, where does it exist in my database, in my, in my sort of set of sequences, in my genome. And then when I have that, I can just go directly into that. And instead of searching all of the places, I only search one in 10,000 places because that's how often these things occur. Uh, yes, Guillaume, we're going to look at locally sensitive hashing variants shortly. All right. So why does this even work? And the reason for that is that, um, you know, if I know that two things are going to be quite similar, like 90% similar, then I only have so many mismatches to distribute in my whole sequence. So basically, if I know that my query is going to be 90% similar to my target, then I can just search all of the neighborhoods to basically look for uh, matches. And yeah, this one might not match, and this one might not match, but this one might match. And therefore, I have a lot of opportunities to find a hit and then extend that hit out. Why do we process the neighborhood for the query instead of pre-processing on the original string and just having more entries in the hash table instead? Yeah, that's a great way. So are you, uh, absolutely. So I could simply create a database that hashes every string not just for you know uh, where it is, but where all of the near neighbors are. The reason why we're doing the neighborhood search on the query rather than on the database is because it allows us to tune the parameter. Because if I did the neighborhood expansion on the database, I would have to choose only one threshold from the beginning. Whereas by doing it at query time, I'm basically allowing the threshold to be chosen uh, at that at that time. Any other questions? Okay, so we are basically building on the concept of hashing. We're now creating a very big table to search into. We're searching the neighborhood of our query and every such window. And every time we have a hit, we're expanding it out on both sides to decide if it's a match or not, okay? And the reason why it works, as I mentioned earlier, is because we only have so many places where we can put those mismatches. A very simple idea of uh, why this works is that if you have you know, two pigeons and three holes, there must be at least one hole with no pigeon. And if you basically have 90% identity with 100 nucleotides, there must be a stretch of 10 nucleotides that doesn't have a single mismatch. And in practice, there's going to be more pigeons per hole because of the way that you distribute those. But even in the worst case, you're going to have a strong enough uh, match. So basically, if you have these two pigeons to distribute, these two mismatches to distribute, chances are there's going to be a stretch with no pigeons at all, with no mismatches. All right, so that's the basic BLAST algorithm. And then uh, there are several ideas beyond this WMUMER indexing. So basically, we like things to be faster or better sensitivity with fewer false negatives. One way to do that is to basically do filtering to eliminate low complexity regions because they cause spurious hits. We can simply filter out all, all low complexity regions in our query, or we can even filter most overrepresented items in our database. That's a little weird, right? It basically says, wow, I'm hashing all these tenmers, and I'm going to eliminate the thousand most frequent tenmers. I mean, that sounds counterintuitive. Why would you want to do that? And the reason is that the 10 most frequent tenmers are probably going to be, you know, so, so frequent that they don't allow you to narrow down the set of sequences that are truly matching to your query. So, you know, it's, it's sort of a very cool trick to eliminate things that are just simply so promiscuous that they're not very informative. What's information content? Information content is basically sort of, if I ask a yes, no question, it should limit the space by half. 
if I ask, oh, is the suspect a human? Uh, it's not really informative. The suspect is most likely human. Is the suspect between the ages of 20 and, you know, 60? Yeah, well, yeah, ne nearly all people know all suspects are going to be. So, you know, I'm not really asking the right question. So if you're saying, well, is this sequence containing an A? And every sequence contains an A, it's not really that informative. So basically, if I, if I find things that are just so overrepresented that they're not informative, I can just simply throw them out. The other idea is what Nah had suggested earlier, which is use two smaller W-mers rather than a single longer one. So basically, I can use hashing twice. I can basically you know, look for one hit and another hit that are nearby. And that's a, a much more sensitive search method uh, than, you know, so basically at every speed, it's more sensitive and at every sensitivity, it's faster. So this, and the reason for that is that simply, that's how evolution works. Evolution doesn't tend to preserve these super, super long stretches, but it tends to preserve smaller uh, stretches. And then, uh, you know, Guillaume suggested uh, locality sensitive hashing. So beyond WMERS, I could search for non-consecutive WMERS. So basically, one way is to basically search for um, a lower dimensional projection of my tenmer into a four-dimensional space rather than a 10-dimensional space. And then the key idea here is that I'm going to search with a cone where only certain characters matter and other characters are wildcards. And I can first decide on this wildcard. And then that's sort of the random projections idea that Califano introduced and that Indic uh, sort of improved upon. And uh, these are uh, first choosing the positions of those stars at random and then um, studying with what frequency our mismatch is found. And then if I can project with multiple neighborhoods, I can basically create this uh, higher frequency of uh, preservation. All right, so that's the BLAST algorithm. The whole concept is that we're going to be hashing, just like for the linear time string matching in the karp ravin algorithm, but we're going to create this very large hash table, and we're going to search that hash table using neighborhood search. And there's some very cool modifications, like two-hit BLAST and hashing with cones. So let's see who's with me so far on the third part, this BLAST uh, algorithm. Awesome, so nine, nine, 10, one, one. So um, yeah, you guys are mostly with me, but not 100% with me, and that's okay. It's uh, a bit of a complicated algorithm. Um, so now I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about the probabilistic foundations of sequence alignment. Basically, where are these match and mismatch coming, uh, penalties coming from? We're gonna review the Blossom and the PAM matrices and sort of see these you know, majors that we've been looking at, where do, where do they come from, and how to compute the statistical significance of an alignment score, okay? So when we saw this query word, PQG, we basically said, well, PEG is a close enough match, PRG is a close enough match, and so on and so forth, up until down here, okay? How did we decide which characters are close enough? How did we search through that? Well, the place where this comes from are matrices that basically tell you what should be my penalty for substituting this amino acid with that amino acid, okay? And then, you know, sometimes I have a strong penalty of, I don't know, minus three. Sometimes I have a big reward of four or one and so on and so forth. So uh, that's in protein space. That's basically how we search for that neighborhood in protein space. But it's the same thing that we did earlier when we looked at nucleotide space. Basically, in some cases, we decided to reward matches by the same amount and to penalize mismatches by different amounts based on whether uh, you know, an A was swapped with a G or a C with a T, which are transitions versus transversions for all other substitutions, which are much more unlikely. So where do these scores come from? And 
how do we know whether two aligned sequences are actually related or not? So what should these alignment scores represent? Well, what they should represent is the probability that two similar sequences are indeed evolutionarily related. In other words, homologous. What is the likelihood ratio between two different hypotheses? The first hypothesis is that the alignment that I'm observing is due to chance. That's the unrelated hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that the alignment that I'm observing is actually due to common ancestry. That's the related hypothesis. And what I want to do is calculate the probability of observing the alignment that I observe according to each hypothesis. So what is the probability that X is aligned on top of Y given the unrelated model versus the related model? Okay, what's the, prob the probability of aligning X on top of Y exactly the way that I have them by model U or by model R? So the alignment score should represent the likelihood ratio between the two hypotheses, namely the probability that the alignment is not due to chance is simply the likelihood ratio between PXY given related divided by PXY given unrelated. And I could compute as a score the log of that probability. And the aha moment that I want you to eventually get is that additive matrices do exactly that, okay? Additive matrices are basically computing exactly that likelihood ratio. So let's expand out the probability to get to that moment. So the, pro the model for two unrelated sequences is simply the probability of aligning every character of X on top of every character of Y is the independent sampling of every character of X and the independent sampling of every character of Y. So every one of them is just the, pro you know, the product of sampling each of the characters and the product of sampling each of the other characters, okay? The probability of aligning X and Y given the related model is basically the probability of observing the pairs of characters at every one of those positions. And that should be given to us by the probability that these amino acids indeed land on top of each other in you know, alignments that I observe, okay? So, Therefore, the likelihood ratio between the related model and the unrelated model is this related probability P of having amino acid A on top of amino acid G, which is basically the product of this at every position of the alignment. And then the second one is this product of these independent terms at every position, which is basically the product of these two independent probabilities at every position. And the reason why I do this is because I want to sort of have the common I at every position and then take the log of all that, so the log probability, the log odds ratio, is simply the product of all of the logs, which is simply the sum of the logs, which is simply the product of the unrelated model divided by the, re sorry, the related model divided by the unrelated model at every position i, okay? So this is the frequencies of individual characters, and that's the frequency with which those characters are observed on top of each other. And how do I get this? So first of all, let's get to that aha moment. So if I take the sum of the log probabilities, I will basically have the related versus unrelated likelihood ratio, the log likelihood ratio, and that's simply the score that I have for my probability matrix. So if my score substitution, my substitution score, my, the matrix that I was showing you earlier, if that's simply the log of these ratios, then all of the, the additive scores that I've been obtaining will simply be the exact probability ratios of the corresponding sequences, okay? So let's see, who's following me so far? If I take basically this log ratio and I add it up in this additive way of my alignment scores, the exact same machinery that I was using earlier to compute these additive scores will effectively be giving me likelihood ratios as long as I have these uh, two probabilities factored in there.
All right, so this is not looking so great. So seven, 10, six, three, two. So hopefully once everything comes together, you guys will uh, get higher there. So there's two popular sets of matrices for protein sequences. There's PAM matrices and blossom matrices that try to capture the relative substitution of amino acid pairs in response to evolution, okay? What these matrices basically tell you is the frequency with which I expect to see amino acids on top of each other if the two sequences are related versus if the two sequences are unrelated, okay? So what the Blossom 62 matrix is doing is basically looking at blocks sum at 62% identity. And it's basically saying with what frequency do I expect to see these um, two amino acids on top of each other if they're related or if they're unrelated. It's the likelihood ratio between the two. Notice that along the diagonal, the numbers are in fact changing quite a lot. Matching a tryptophan to a tryptophan gives me a score of 11, whereas matching an isoleucine to an isoleucine gives me a score of four. Why is that? Because tryptophans are more rare. They're much more likely to be ending up aligned on top of each other by chance. Whereas a solution to a solution, given that it's a more common amino acid, these are much more likely to be aligned on top of each other due to chance. Also, if I match a leucine to an isoleucine, I still get a positive score. I get actually a reward for a mismatch. And the reason for that is that, you know, biochemically they're very similar. And therefore, evolution switches them very often. And therefore, when I look at these frequencies with which these amino acids are found on top of each other in related versus unrelated sequences, they're much more likely to be related if I see them on top of each other. So basically, the substitution matrix score for every pair AB is simply the frequency with which I find them on top of each other versus what I would expect by chance. And I can build these matrices using this exact principle. And therefore, as I add up my scores, these numbers, I can train them directly on blocks of aligned and blocks of randomly occurring pairs of characters. And these blocks are basically going to be dictated straight from these um, amino acid substitution penalties which is basically going to be uh, corresponding directly to that alignment score. So to recap, putting it all together, what we were doing in that spreadsheet where we were looking up these values of what is the penalty that I should pay for aligning an A into a C or an A into a G, if I use numbers that stem directly from that likelihood ratio of how frequently do I see them together in, in a true aligned set of sequences versus a uh, random set of sequences, then whatever score I'm computing by adding up all these numbers throughout my alignment and throughout my dynamic programming matrix to get to the bottom, all of these scores are gonna have an immediate probabilistic interpretation, which is gonna be exactly the likelihood ratio of observing this alignment given the related model or given the unrelated model. So that's basically coming full circle and connecting these initial substitution matrices and those scores with the likelihood ratio of those alignments. So that gives me directly the probability of an alignment given this related or unrelated model. And how do we build these matrices in the first place? So what Hennikoff and Hennikoff, husband and wife, did in PNAS in 1992 is that they estimated these probabilities from blocks of sequence fragments that represent structurally conserved regions in the proteins. And they built such blocks with proteins that were at 60% uh, sequence identity, 50% sequence identity, 45% sequence identity. So they had structurally aligned them, and they said, aha, these must correspond, and then they built those together. Okay? So let's see who's with me so far on the fourth part, namely the probabilistic foundations of the sequence alignment of sort of using the scores that come from related versus unrelated, and then looking at the corresponding frequencies, and then using these frequencies as part of the substitution score 
for a match or a mismatch, and then ending up with um, probability of the whole alignment using this additive score. So we have 11, 12, 4, 4, 0. So most people are following very, very well. All right, so um, we could stop there, and you guys are welcome to sign off. There's some optional material that I wanna cover for the next few minutes. So you guys are welcome to stay. This is not gonna be on any exams or any other thing. This is purely for your interest. So just to sum up, what we've done today is that we've looked at global alignments versus local alignment. We looked at needleman Wunsch, which is this global top left to bottom right, versus Smith-Waterman, which is creating these small blocks. And we also looked at varying gap penalties. We looked at linear time exact string matching, where we were using the semi-numerical interpretation of our sequences and the carp rabin algorithm. We saw how initially it didn't quite work, but we fixed it using hash functions and using these, uh, you know, introduced this concept of a randomized algorithm. And then we went from exact string matching to inexact string matching using the BLAST algorithm, where we were hashing with a neighborhood search. And that allowed us to now uh, first search for all of the neighbors, that's the inexact part, and then hash, that's the exact part, which makes it super fast. And then we saw variations like two hit blast and hashing with combs that allow you to either speed things up or be more sensitive. And then we looked at the probabilistic foundations of sequence alignment, where these mismatch and match penalty scores come from in the Blossom case uh, with these blocks of related sequences and how we can compute the statistical significance of an entire alignment by adding up these probabilistic interpretations of the score, which at every position gives me the log likelihood ratio of this character alignment being by chance or not chance, and then adding up across all of them, the, the sum of the logs, i.e. the log of the products, i.e. the total product of probabilities at every independent position of my alignment of the two sequences being related or not related. So first of all, a quick poll of who's with me now on the entire lecture so far, the first four parts. How well are you following? Great. So um, doing pretty good. So 11, 4, 3, 1, 0. So 25 people above medium, middle and only one person below middle. This is kind of good. All right, so now let's talk about deterministic linear time exact string matching. Again, this is all optional material. So the key idea is that we want to gather more information from every comparison. What we want to do is um, pre-process our string to find the, in the, the string self-similarity. And for those of you who have another class, this will be all in YouTube very short. So what I wanna search is a string P inside a longer string T, a pattern inside a text. And I wanna find all of the occurrences of P in T, which are exact matches in linear time. How do I do that? So, one way to do that is to basically just simply scan that into this every single time matching the corresponding characters. However, I can do better than that. I can basically uh, realize that, wait a minute, every time I have a mismatch here, I can just make a, a bigger jump. Namely, if I understand the self matching of a small string onto itself, I can basically jump further every single time. So if all of the characters in the pattern are the same, then I can basically say, oh, I have a match, match. If I have a mismatch here, do I need to research the first offset? Probably not, because I know that the A won't match here. So that basically means that I can make bigger jumps if my sequence self-similarity is 100%. Because every time I have one mismatch, I can just jump by three. It doesn't matter what that character is. All I know is that it's not an A. 
Okay. So that's one extreme case where I basically went from having uh, M times N comparisons to having only N comparisons because I only need to check the first character, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth character. So this is actually order N comparisons by gathering information about my string each time I do this. Okay? So this should be fairly kind of cool. At the other extreme, if every one of my characters is different, I've searched for A, B, C, D, and suppose that I've matched them, then I don't need to sort of research at the same position because I know that there's no self-similarity. So I can just make a huge jump each time. So there's at most N matching comparisons and there's at most N non-matching comparisons. So that's again order N comparisons. So in both cases, if I have all characters be the same and all characters be distinct, I can basically do this in order n time. So by extrapolation, we're going to show that in fact we can do this for all cases, even in the middle. So in the special case where all characters are the same, each order n. In the special case where all characters are different, each order n. And in the general case, what we're going to do is very cool. We're going to learn the internal redundancy structure of our pattern by doing a pattern pre-processing step. And the, the three methods for that are fundamental pre-processing, newt morris Pratt, or finite state machine. So how am I gonna learn the internal redundancy structure of a string? So what I wanna know is this z vector that basically tells me the length over which the current string matches the beginning of that string, okay? So over here at position five, the length over which the string, the suffix starting at that position, the length over which this matches the prefix of that string is three, okay? So because AAB matches AAB, but X is different from C. So that basically means that the length of that Z vector, the Z vector basically tells me the length of the internal redundancy of that substring starting at that position versus the substring starting at the start position. Okay, who's with me so far on that internal redundancy vector, Z? That basically tells me what is the length over which I'm matching myself at the beginning of the string versus the position at the string that I'm at now. This is awesome. So, um, we have eight, seven, two, three, zero. This is awesome. So therefore, I'm going to define this thing called the Z box that basically tells me for how long am I matching myself at the beginning, OK? And then I'm going to define the R vector to basically tell me what is the right position over which the longest Z box that I'm in ends, OK? And then, of course, the left position is going to basically say, what is the starting position of the longest Z box that just ended where I am now, okay? So at every character K, I will have the left pointer and the right pointer basically tell me both sides. And the key question is, can we compute the Z vector, the right pointers and the left pointers in linear time? And the proof for that, is effectively reusing these floors as I'm building them. So if K is outside a Z box, I'm simply gonna compute ZK. If K is inside a Z box, I can just look up ZK because the self-redundancy at this position is the same thing as the self-redundancy at that position if I'm inside a box that's self-similar to the start because K prime basically should have exactly the same as this K here, because I'm inside this redundancy pattern, which is kind of cool. So if I exploit this redundancy to basically compute this vector, then I can just simply compute every position from the left all the way to the right by either computing it or reusing it. And in both cases, 
I can still compute it in linear time, which is uh, you know very important. So if you basically get this intuition, you can of course look at the slides to get you know all of the details. But if I get if you get this intuition, I can simply compute the z vector by reusing this left and the right vector and you know reusing my computation. And the coolest part of it all is that if I can compute all of these things in linear time, then I can basically simply com concatenate my pattern and my text with a nonsensical character in the middle that doesn't exist in either the pattern or the text. And if I can compute the entire z vector for my concatenated string in time n plus m, then I can just simply report all starting positions where zi is exactly the same as p, because that's all of the positions where there's an internal redundancy and therefore where this string matches that string here. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of cool. All right, who feels that this was uh, kind of cool? So let's see, relaunch the polling. Uh, sorry, who, 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 who get this? The fact that if I can compute the internal redundancy, I can do all of these computations in linear time because I'm sort of expanding and rebuilding on the internal self-redundancy. And then as I get to the end of that string, I effectively have, you know, the entire computation uh, effectively done. Awesome. So uh, we have uh, 55210. This is awesome. And that's the deterministic linear time, at least sketch of an idea to basically complete these uh, linear uh, searches. All right, so on Thursday, we're gonna talk about uh, hit markup models, and uh, on Friday, we're gonna have another one of those uh, mentoring sessions. Thank you guys, thanks for staying over time, and then uh, looking forward to seeing you all soon, bye-bye.